Well, seizing the moment, I'm going to go ahead and fire this whole thing up. Uh, my name is Mike Goodenough. I'm the Vice President of Cloud Solutions and Innovations coming from a company called BCM1. Uh, we've been here since the early 90s within New York City, uh, servicing lots of different verticals um, and have uh, a really solid customer base and, and proven history within our spaces. Um, today, folks, I, I want to take you down a path of trying to change a little bit of the understanding. Um, do it a little bit differently, right? I'm going to kind of involve you folks in the, in the discussion here some, um, and I'm going to get scientific. Now, you don't have to worry. Me getting scientific doesn't mean that you folks have to follow down that same path, but I want to kind of bring you into the same space that I live in. Thank you very much, by the way. IP soft rocks. All right, so um, how many people in this room have been dealing with cloud for the past five to 10 years? Did you just raise your hand? Okay, awesome. All right, so there's a couple. In the past two to three years, awesome. And then for the rest of you folks who are kind of new to the whole space, is that the idea? Yeah, okay. Um, IoT, now when I say cloud, do you guys consider that IoT is actually the cloud? How many people in this room, raise your hands, if you think IoT is actually truly the cloud? I got one, awesome. I hope every two, I hope every hand in this room goes up by the end of this discussion, okay? Um, the cloud is generalized, and what we've done is we've made a very common mistake. We've acted as if the cloud was just this one thing. And in fact, it's not. It's the super Walmart of everything that you can need, whether you're a developer, whether you're infrastructure, whether you're network, whether you're security. It's everything that you can need. It's a service. As those services come together, they form a simple architecture. And that architecture supports what you want to do from an application's perspective or from a user experience perspective. Right? So as we look at what the cloud is as a whole, I'm going to break down for you today what are the most important factors of IoT and cloud? Right? right now, there are absolutely two factors within this whole space. Oh, we mix them in a moment, sorry. There are, there's two components within this whole space which stand out so apparent it's ridiculous, and that's security and data. And I'll break that down for you and explain that to you in a minute here. We're going to look at the impact of IoT. Where is it having impact? Where, as a consumer or as a reseller, does it have impact to your story and why you should be paying attention? And you all should, because the level of growth within the space is astronomical. It's like nothing we've ever seen. I'm going to show you some statistics that should make you walk away from here going, why am I just dealing with this now? Uh, we're going to talk about the evolution of IoT and its interconnection with the cloud. I'm going to break down Microsoft for you guys. I could have broken down IBM. I could have broken down Amazon. I could have broken down some of the other primary providers, which give you a complete picture of the product stack as a whole. But instead of getting you all confused, I decided I was going to zoom in one. So please forgive the absolute focus into the Microsoft portfolio. It simplifies it enough where I can tell the story for you. This is equivalent to when you're utilizing another cloud provider that might be out there. Um, IoT is access to the cloud. Um, every single one of these IoT devices that are out there right now will have access, which means the one common thread between IoT and your infrastructure is network. It all has to be transmitted one way or another. Um, and data from the endpoint. So how many of you folks have been in this industry for at least 10 years? Awesome, just about everybody in the room. I come from a mainframe world, that's where I started. Dumb terminals, having binary code being transmitted over a simple, piece of hardware that sits somewhere in a data center. Well, guess what we're going back to, folks? We're going right back to the exact same place. We thought we were getting rid of devices. We're not. I'm going to show you numbers that are going to blow your mind. Every one of these devices have a refresh process. Remember that. They might not have the process put in place today, but they're going to need to be refreshed. So the numbers you're about to see, which should blow your mind, don't even take into consideration the level of refresh that are going to happen around the space. So with that being said, one final thing to take into consideration as we break this down. IoT has been around for a while. I can spend $47 and build a monitoring system that will monitor my plant, the humidity, the sun. It will monitor everything about that plant for $47. Bucks. That includes an Intel processor, that includes the board, the sensors, everything. I can build a device that I can wear, and my kids are doing it in middle school, that will monitor how much I sweat, what's my heart rate, what I'm doing for $47. What that means to you is that there are a ton of developers out there who are going to absolutely make their dreams come true. 
including maybe yourselves, right? It is now not a game of millions, it's a game of thousands. And the industry is going to continue to explode. All right, so with that being said, let's step on through. Uh, uh, metadata as a whole, let's see if I can just pop this off. Excellent. Two biggest areas of growth, metadata and security. Okay, so why is data so important? The first statistic that you see up here, which states that 90% of the world's digital data has been generated in the past two years. This is a statistic that's two years old. It's not correct. 90% of the data two years ago had been created in two years' time frame. Today's statistic, seven times that number. We have, in the past two years, amassed, amassed more data than the history of mankind seven times over. That's the growth in the past four years. So in our industry, what is the largest adopting factor? It's data. It's the security that goes behind data. Furthermore, uh, and I'm going to stay over on data for a minute. Every day, we're, developing, we're, we're creating 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. If you don't know what that word means, that's the point. That's how much data. It's beyond even what your normal conversations are. Every day. Every single day. The fact is that this data has to be transmitted. It has to be secured. It has to be stored. It has to be able to be analyzed. That's a really important topic because when I say I want to analyze my data, analyzing a couple of tables or a couple billion transactions, that's hard enough. But if it's multiplying by 5x every two years, if I don't have true analytics, cognitive learning, machine learning in place, I'm never going to be able to analyze my data. And so I'm going to take you down that path here in a minute explain you how that makes sense to us. 650% more projected in the next five years. Anybody out there wondering what my focus should be? Does that not scream to you, wake up before the sun crashes into the earth? Am I, it, it, it's absolutely astronomical. It's almost the equivalent of us being able to define DNA and the structure that makes up a DNA strand. It's that incredible, right? Mapping a genome equivalent. Five point, now let's go over security. 5.5 million new things are going to be connected every day, every day, every day. That's insane. All of these things need to be secured. Now, as I talk about these statistics, there was a new release just out by Gartner and IBM in a joint effort. There is only an estimated 10% of the current IoT devices that are out there that are actually secured. 10%. That means every one of us has some type of violation that sits within our infrastructures. Every single one of us. If we're not addressing this concern, cybersecurity will be something that you can't even pronounce because your mouth's going to be tied shut because you weren't talking about the right things in the beginning. Right? Sorry, I got a little demonic there. <laughs> um, Gardner's saying that there's over 6.4 billion connected devices today. Refresh, people. That screams to me. Nobody has a three to five year plan behind this, much less the capacity planning. Right? In case you're wondering who's adopting all of this, the entire Empire State Building is IoT. Every window is solar, every light switch, every thermostat, every fan, every air mover, every elevator, every turnstile, everything in that building is IoT aware. It is the future. It's a building. Apply this to your pod stations, apply this to your RFIDs, apply this to your shipping, apply this to anything that we're talking about, right? 38 million connected devices. Growing exponentially. Um, so, how, how how does this IoT device look? And I, and I really want to get through this piece of the fast because I want to save us time for the slide that hopefully is going to freak you out a little bit. Um, ultimately, if we're looking up at the top, right? You are, you have machine learning, you have storage, you have analytics, you have an event hub, and you have devices. All right, I went backwards. So let's take it from the beginning. You have devices. We all have a device. They all have an iPad, a mobile device. Now, those are truly mobile, all right? So let's not mix the two worlds too much. But they're about to be mixed. Because every single one of the telecom providers that are out there with a mobile platform have just designed a chip that can now be soldered on to any one of these IoT devices for $3 a month, giving you a mobile-to-mobile -mobile capability. So these devices, which used to only connect over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, are now going to choose another protocol. That means all of us have to come up with a solid end-to-end -end plan. We have to come up with a solid plan for how that mobile to mobile is going to communicate over our network, and if we have to secure that traffic. So again, it all ties back into how we have a truly intelligent network when it comes down to it. 
Those devices are connected through an event hub. You guys know what event hubs are. You're getting tweets every day. You're getting some type of event that's coming to you, right? It's referencing that material. It's then streaming that information over to some analytics, right? A dashboard that you're reading that information. How many people came into my building in the past hour? What floor are they on, right? It then takes that data and stores it. It then takes that store data, store data and it starts to bring in machine learning. How many people in here get machine learning? All right, cool. I, I'm, I'm kind of glad. Let me break it down for you. When I have billions of transactions, I have to figure out, and I have to figure out how all those devices are communicating best. I might be able to build a model because I built these devices or I wrote the application, but I can't build the thousands of models that help me to be predictive. Who here has heard of predictive analytics and seen something from an organization? All right, we get some hands. Predictive analytics means this. I'm a building owner in New York City. As a building owner, the electric companies can call me in 30 seconds, I'm gonna have a brownout. They're gonna call me and tell me I have 30 seconds to deal with that brownout. If I'm not predictively able to say where the people are that are in my elevators, where the people are that are on my floors, that 30 seconds means nothing to me. I'm not able to be predictive and act ahead of time of the action. I am forced to deal with people being trapped in my elevators. Predictive analytics gives us the ability to be ahead of the curve. It says that if I watch all of my data over the next five years and I create models, well then, when I see an event happening that looks like one of those models, I can determine that that model is actually happening. Can a human do that? No. Right? So those predictive analytics, that machine learning comes into place and helps us to create that modeling. It helps us to not have to be the brains behind the computer. The reality is, folks, we're collecting so much data, we're using machine analytics and machine learning. It's moving faster than we are. It is absolutely moving faster than we are. So if you don't understand the machine learning, the cognitive learning, the business analytics, and how that's important, you need to get involved. These systems are smarter than we are now. It's unequivocal. And they're modeling things that we have spent our lives developing and expertise behind. It takes us to make sense if that's important or not. Right? It can model, but it can't tell us whether it's important or not. All right. With that, how do people connect to all that good stuff that's now being collected up? Well, the end user connects back over to that notification hub, and you're seeing that the event hub talks to the notification hub, and then the web app and the mobile app have their data. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Right? And you all probably got that, and, and I'm sorry for making it too simplified. What's the most important characteristic of all of that? Well, we still have to secure it. We still have to monitor it. We still have to deal with its data. And we still have to deal with its control. Okay, that's where the cloud generalization comes into play. We should be utilizing the same systems to monitor these data. This data. We should be using the same system to actually secure this data. Same teams. We're not. We're leaving it banking. We're taking the data and we're putting it into a space. We're not actually sharing it in an appropriate way. The fabulous thing is that the world of the developer is coming into sync with the world of all of the rest of us. Why is the developer important? Because the developer uses a community. The developer relies on one another. The developer actually, within the, the total hierarchy of, of an organization, they're the people that share their code. They're the people that talk about what problems they're having and how one another fix them. They're the ones that actually keep each other up to speed with what's going on. We in IT generally don't. Our storage people are our storage people, our network people are our network people. We're very isolated, right? Cloud finally brings those worlds together, and that's really important because when I want to talk about network, when I want to talk about CPU, memory, disk, I need to understand what the application is doing. That's truly the only important thing is the user experience that comes to that application. All right, how many people in this room remember the periodic table? Raise your hand. All right, keep them up if you were overwhelmed by it the first time you saw it. All right, good. I'm about to show you another periodic table, and you're about to feel overwhelmed. But remember, when you saw the first periodic table and then somebody explained to you that it was silver, gold, copper, you started to sort of understand what that periodic table meant. Suddenly, it wasn't so mystical in its existence, right? Now, I told you, I'm going to let you know that the cloud is truly IoT, and IoT is truly the cloud. And that's why I'm bringing this periodic table up. So, the periodic table of elements for Microsoft Azure. Again, I could do this with IBM, Amazon, or any of the other products that are out there. But this is simple for us, all right? All these colors overwhelming, all these acronyms overwhelming, all of these pieces, but let's break it down real simple. Internet of Things, that exists off the top left-hand side. 
CPU, compute, what we used to consider infrastructure as a service. This is what everybody's telling you cloud is. Look at that for a minute, and then look at where that exists. It's four portions of the periodic table. Only four. So if you've been learning that infrastructure as a service is the cloud, you've only learned a small fraction of this equation. All right, so let's keep going for a minute. Let's not be overwhelmed with it. Let's demystify this for a minute. Web and mobile, you guys all know web and mobile. Every one of you got a mobile device in your hand, right? Web and mobile actually starts to make up this long item and chart down here. Wow, Microsoft's cloud suddenly becomes a lot more than just infrastructure as a service, doesn't it? Keep going. Data and storage, what have we been talking about the past couple of minutes? Holy Hannah, look at how much it's filling up with that whole periodic table. Management and security down here. I'll open this up for you so you can see it a little better in a second. But I wanted you to understand, it breaks down to 10 categories. That's it. 10 categories. 286 products into 10 categories. That's where we need to start forming our roles and responsibilities for our internal teams. If we're talking about taking my web team and tying it into my mobile team, we've got to understand what part of the cloud joins those two together. This becomes your bridge, people. This becomes how you bring them all together, right? Keep them going. Let's break that down just a little bit more. Let's explode that screen. Data factory, event hubs, streaming analytics, machine learning. We just talked about those a minute ago. Suddenly you understand this periodic table more than you thought. Huh. Add in HD Insight. So you guys have all heard of Hadoop, right? Is there anybody in the room that hasn't heard of Hadoop? All right, this is Hadoop. Well, does it, doesn't Amazon have to do? Yep. Doesn't Google? Doesn't all of the other clouds? Yes, they do. The thing is, if I'm talking about migrating you from one cloud to another cloud, I should be talking about how I'm taking your application layer and moving it to application layer. I'm not talking about moving your virtual machine and all of its problems. And so when we talk about the cloud, again, it comes back to the application, doesn't it? It comes back to the most important factor. And then our developers are the ones who are actually building those applications. And they're the ones, how many of you have had your developers in your cloud conversations with IT? That's the problem, right? That's why we don't go anywhere with this. Because they are the people who will consume and understand it. But the, if I showed you the developer's periodic table of elements, <laughs> you all would sit here and be completely lost. In fact, oftentimes I still am when I look at that one. All right, so moving on. Um, again, this is security, right? So this is your security, traffic management, express routing, virtual networks, DNS, application gateways. Suddenly this whole thing starts to make sense. But when you're talking about Azure, when you're talking about cloud, you have to talk about it as a whole object. You can't talk about it as just infrastructure as a service. It doesn't tell you enough. If we talk about CPU, memory, and disk, none of that is gonna help me to plan my capacity for the growth of 500x. It's just not going to happen. We have to know what the application's expectation is, the scale, and what that transformation is going to be. Otherwise, honestly, we're looking our finger, checking for the wind, and hoping to God we're going to come up with the right assessment. Right? It's pie in the sky. So, how do we start to create, and what is the biggest disruptors within this space? Well, in Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, Salesforce, all of these different suppliers have come up with the ability to privately route your traffic to their public cloud. All right, that's cool. That means that I can now control the traffic of these IoT devices. I can now say that it's transmitting data and I can secure the data. I can secure the transport that that data is being carried on. And I can secure the location where that data is being set. So the only thing I have left to harden is a physical endpoint device. Okay, so with that being said, well, how the heck does this work, right? It's brand new, it's brand new in the market. This slide kind of breaks it down for you, right? There's currently only 10 network service providers who give you the ability to tie into this hotel of, of services. Um, and it's somewhat costly, and they all do things differently. If you all have worked with Verizon, you know they're not the same as AT&T, and if you work with AT&T, you know they're same, not the same as the others. So. We have to become also effective in how we deal with that third party or that additional party. So what's happening to the Verizons and the AT&Ts of the world? Well, these folks are becoming cloud brokers. They're moving off their own private clouds. They're moving away from them. And they're going to become a cloud broker. They're going to help you to understand how you can create this connectivity and then how you can move an application workload from one point to the other. However, they're never going to truly understand the infrastructure that supports each other. Microsoft knows Microsoft. 
Amazon knows EC2. Amazon knows SmallDB. Amazon knows Linux. That's what they were built around. Google built off their own space. They're never truly going to understand the complete interoperability of each other, nor are they going to develop towards it. So the only commonality is the application layer, right? And the routing. So as you get into this, really the biggest thing that we're faced with in the very near future is developing a true architecture within our own network to be able to handle mobile, handle IoT, handle the throttle, bring in SDN, right? Because the software defined network will allow me to take traffic from my .NET deployment and pass it to my .NET deployment. Not pass it to my Oracle deployment, but pass it to my .NET. And I can prioritize that, right? It becomes important. It becomes something that I can guarantee that application level user experience, right? All right. So, again, I chose Microsoft. Please forgive me. It just happens to be one that the story is, is most simplified. It was either that or Oracle, and Oracle's had some really bad PR lately, so I'm excited about we bring up. So I talked about the big data. I talked about the analytics, the cognitive learning, the importance, right? Well, how does that mean anything to me? I, I mean, I'm an IT guy. I have IP addresses. I have Juniper Network gear. I've got, I don't necessarily really have IoT or where I can bring in machine learning or cognitive learning, do I? Absolutely. Every one of these products are commonly sold in all of those different cloud providers I was just talking about a minute ago. Every one of them are creating data that you can help to create a footprint that looks like and gives you access when you predictively want to go back and say, hey, what did June 1st look like? 2010, because that was the day that this happened to my company. We went public on the stock market. I want to see the PR equivalent when we went public. How can I accomplish that? This was the day that we had a virus in my network. I want to make sure that whenever I have a virus, I have that exact fingerprint, because it's a fingerprint, people. And this data trending is a fingerprint. No two days are alike. No two days are alike. That's so important to say. That's like your own fingerprint. It's your own DNA. And so if we're able to look at the modeling that happens behind any one of these technologies, we can begin to actually predict what's happening with our own environment. And that is our future. We're no longer going to have monitoring systems that tell you when there's an outage. We're going to have a monitoring system that tells you uh, two hours before an outage happens. Right? We're going to be able to start running our world at the nanosecond. That's extraordinary. That's something we've never, ever even taken into consideration. So. With that, we are only two minutes behind schedule. I wanted to go ahead and open it up for questions. I think, can you guys just raise your hand up between the, these four slides? I'd like to leave up one of those slides for you all. Um, raise your hand if you'd like this to be that slide. All right, I got one. Raise your hand if you'd like it to be this one. And the final one, we'll leave this one. All right, thanks for all that. <clears throat> Participation. <laughs> Any questions out there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, so this is Microsoft's. Um, so no, unlike a unlike a uh, unlike a standard periodic table where we kind of correlate with you know the, the atomic weight and other factors. No, it doesn't. Um, they kind of grouped them, I think, in, intentionally on um, a color variation. No, no way. I'm sorry. No. Nope. <laughs> um, I wanted to work on this with them, and in fact, uh, build out a next gen to this because it has morphed in some. And this is actually from 2015, or early 2015, like Jan 1, so I consider it 2014. Kind of like a car. If it's bought in the beginning of the year, it was really the year before. Yeah. Um, other questions? How, yes, sir. So, the role of data scientists. So, Dan, you know, you, you really hit a big thing for me. Um, one of my big themes is bringing back the science. Right? Uh, when I went to school, we had to get a degree in computer science. Um, data scientists have a degree in the science of that data. Um, as IT people, we tend to hire these certified individuals. That does not mean they understand capacity planning. That does not mean that they understand things that make up the science that underlies the technology. And that's why we're in the place that we're in today. So what's the role of the data scientist? Honest to God, to bring the science back. And I'm so dying for this. It's not even funny. I have a hashtag. You can follow a lot of it. Um, the scientist leads the way. Whether it be a true computer scientist, the research and development side, the developer world, or the data scientist. 
Um, they help us really bring this cognitive learning, analyze the cognitive learning, bring the modeling into perspective. My business intelligence is going to show me potentially 300 different ways that I can look at my data. My data scientist is the one that's going to have to actually sit down and figure out which way is going to affect my business right. Correct? So it's just going to show me the anomalies. It's going to show me a map. If that map means nothing to my business, well then I'm SOL, right? Seriously out of line, not the other way. Fair enough? Does that answer your question? Do you agree? Yes. You do. And, and to be honest, where, where do you find this? <laughs> um, <laughs> I ran a CIO roundtable at another uh, a session. Um, it's not just New York. It's as a whole. We're finding that finding these skills, and it's not just around data, it's around network, it's around the growth as a whole. We're not able to fill that gap. Um, and that's because the technology, what I was saying to you before, is moving faster than we're moving. We're not gonna be able to find the skills, period. Um, unless this room becomes cohesive and coherent for what that future's gonna be, and it's now, it's upon us. We need you guys to be involved with all of this. This experience in this room is what the past 20 years has been, right? All the knowledge, all the business, all the machine learning in the world isn't going to be able to actually make sense of that information and how it maps appropriately. Right? I can show you every IP used in the world web, but unless you actually see how that traffic is moving between those IP addresses, it means nothing. It's a list. It's a table. Right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. So if we get to the point where we're managing the world at the end second, it also means something goes wrong, if it goes wrong, it goes quicker. Uh, what, what, what kind of thought is being put into the science? Is that just part of the human process, or is it something that needs a lot of work? Definitely needs a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of front runners, right, in dealing with predictive analytics, and it's, and it's really nothing new, right? So IBM started building green data centers back in 2000. First, you know, 2002, I was part of a huge effort where we thought, and um, is there anybody from IBM in the room? <laughs> no, okay. Um, you know, we thought we were going to be able to move with the sun. I was going to be able to move workloads from one data center to the next, to the next, to the next, move with the sun, power it down, move the workloads. Um, suddenly we realized that's a lot of data to push over a line on a regular basis. <laughs> but we did make every device within that data center aware, whether it was the rack, whether it was the sensor for the earthquake, whether it was... And so as we went, the concepts of what we could be predictive on evolved. Um, and so we're seeing that, right? AT&T has been doing predictive analytics for a long time. Verizon is, is doing a lot around it. Cybersecurity has created a huge demand around these predictive capabilities. Um, so I feel really that what we're going to start to be able to do is turn to AT&T and say, hey, give me your SDN aware predictive analytics, let me apply it to my own HD insight, let me apply it to my own modeling, right? So I think we're going to see cookbooks and best practices around this come, and we should be demanding this, by the way, from our suppliers, right? We should not be happy with just standard monitoring. So if you're buying cloud from a private data center, if you're buying VMware, you need to go back and say, Predictive analytics in your models, I need to apply them to my stuff because I can't keep up with how fast you're pushing it. Right? So um, I, I see a lot of that changing and morphing, which scares me a little bit too. Um, you know, whenever I build a tool that deals with business intelligence, the first thing that's questioned is the algorithm. <laughs> the algorithm is our intellectual property also at the same time. Right? So it needs to be proven. And, and this is part of what we've always used as a tier one requirement. It has to be proven in the industry for three to five years to even adopt it. We've forgotten about that. Right? We're adopting every new cloud. It comes out four months later, we're adopting it. VMware launches every six months some new release. We're adopting it. We've gotten rid of the standards, the science that kept us protected. Right? We've gotten rid of it. We need to bring it back. Um, and I think the predictive modeling will actually help us to get there and keep us on that edge. Um, but we can't be expected to spend the time to create that. We have to be expected to be the community that feeds it and says whether it works or not, but we can't be the community that actually creates it. Maybe some of us can, that are out there, that are building those IoT devices. Can I just ask, from, how many developers do we have in the room? Wow, all right, so at least we're close to almost a third of the group is developers, that's great. Any other questions? No? All right, Gardner has a couple of magic quadrants around the space, I would suggest that you look at their magic quadrant around cognitive learning. 
Um, I would suggest that you reach out to the organizations within that space. There's a lot to be had. There's a lot of wonderful white papers and a lot of knowledge to be shared. Um, if you have any questions, BCM1. Uh, our website has some phenomenal blogs. We're constantly doing CIO roundtables and councils, CTO roundtables and councils, trying to see um, you know, where they're at. And I'll tell you, um, for you folks in the room, how many of you have customers or deal with building management? Nobody. Okay, well then I won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, extraordinary. I, I met with a group of CIOs and the amount of data, the number of IoT devices in their infrastructures, the way that they're managing and monitoring this data, extraordinary. They form governance groups, they form organizations that help to regulate who really is a tier one provider and who isn't above and beyond Gartner. Um, and so uh, it, it's a wonderful side of the organization to see, right? Very, very similar to financial. Financial is also very uh, advanced within that whole space. So thank you very much for your time. I hope this was, uh, let me just ask one more quick question. How many people in the room think that Clyde, Cloud, and IoT are the same now? All right, that's a 90% chance, I like it. Yeah. Thanks, folks, have a great day.